1980, Gabriel Joseph Avicii, his book, a uh, science thriller, came out. It's called The Echo Chamber. And it followed a man into the English countryside so he could rest from what would probably be a mental breakdown. Well, while he was there in um, a psychological thriller way, he didn't get along with the people that were also there at this English countryside manor. And he began to hear their voices talking about him. And they were in the hallways. And then pretty soon, he thinks he hears their voices in the walls. And pretty soon, psychological thriller, he thinks, oh, I hear them in my head, right? So he's stuck in his echo chamber. Well, later that same decade, the title of that book, The Echo Chamber, actually was readopted and redefined as a metaphorical place where beliefs are articulated and reinforced. Communication happens within a closed chamber. Now, let's fast forward. You've probably heard the term echo chamber. It's usually associated when people get stuck within listening to the same media channels or maybe within the same social media networks. Uh, it tends to get associated with politics a lot, so maybe not such a nice way. But let's see. Right, right, right. Next slide, please. And there we go. And next one. There we go. OK. So there were researchers from Oxford last year, and this was published this year, who did a study on echo chambers and said, you know what? They're not inherently bad. It's actually a group, a homogeneous group, that has a similar language, that can talk with one another, they have a safe space because it's a homogeneous network, and they can start to solve problems. Now they are quick to say within the article and realize we're not looking for segregation here, that's not what we're supporting, but what we're saying is an echo chamber in and of itself, it's not a bad place. So sorry, there we go. So on your tables, you had the option to provide either a word or a phrase that you associated with UDL. We have a language within this room. We also have a language within the greater UDL community. And what I'm saying is that I believe we have, next slide please, a UDL echo chamber. Now that echo chamber actually moves around the world. And I want to point out, as it has been a little bit here already, but we have the largest number of participants at this particular summit than we've ever had who are from outside the US. If you would be so kind, wave your arms, make a little bit of noise if you are from outside the US. Thank you so much, and thank you for traveling here. And yeah, you're a part of the UDL echo chamber. <laughs> So next slide, please. Thank you. We have some challenges being a part of the echo chamber, but there are some benefits also. The first one I want to talk about is elitism. So this is a challenge that we have in the UDL community. We know that UDL is good. We know that we meet the variable needs of our learners through providing them flexible means, methods, assessments, right? We aren't placing them within groups or levels and saying that they have to complete some standardized assessment to be able to move outside of those. We know that the barrier sits within the environment and we need to lessen those barriers so that our learners can move toward the goal and toward becoming expert learners. We don't see the barrier as within the learner. We also know that the needs of our learners can turn on a dime and there's no such thing as a specific learning style, new, no. and also personalities shift, right? It's all based on context. These are things that we know, but we sometimes can come off a little snobby to our peers, and especially those who don't have a clear understanding of what universal design for learning is. Now, over the next two days, you have the opportunity to go to different sessions about how to use the framework to design professional learning, a way to reach out to your colleagues. But what I'm asking you to do is to actually think about the framework as you're just having general conversation, especially with people who just might see it as a little elitist, all right? So think about how you are engaging them. Think about how you are bringing them to this idea of UDL, how you're representing the information. And then noticing slight changes in their behavior, in their knowledge set, and celebrating that with them. 
Our second challenge is what is UDL? Now on your tables, you have a half a sheet of paper. It's either purple or white. One person at that piece of, at your table is going to read that half sheet of paper out loud. And at your table, you're gonna decide what's on there is a student teacher description written by her supervising teacher. I want you to decide whether or not that student teacher is implementing UDL based on the description you read. So you have a one minute to go through this and we're gonna start the timer. I'm gonna start mine on my watch too. So go ahead, go. All right, we are at our minute. So if you can go ahead and come back, come back. And come back. All right, so go ahead and go forward one slide for me. We had five different descriptions across this room, so I'm just gonna give you a brief overview of what you had. So one ta a few tables were talking about in control, so forward a slide to in control. And these people read about a student teacher who the expectations were high, clear, nearly always met. She anticipated potential problems before they could start and rewarded positive behaviors. Next. The next, another table, set of tables, was reading about a student teacher who was creative, ability to adapt to various techniques, began in textbooks, moved to thematic teaching, a group science fair instead of using the group of the science textbook, math, she didn't go page by page, but instead met the needs of the students. Next, student teacher, some of you read about who's innovative, so individualized spelling for her learners and had a new hands-on game each week. Next. Some of you read about stimulated higher level thinking. So this student teacher, self-made tests in all subject areas. Uh, there were no multiple choice tests or used from the textbook. Um, textbooks were supplements, used children's literature and media to enhance the lessons. And finally, the next one, motivating. So this teacher stated exact expectations, had cooperative learning going on, moving out of seats. But the big deal about this was because this teacher was in an open classroom environment, and so there's no walls. You just have like bookshelves and chairs there, all right? So the question was whether or not this teacher was implementing UDL. The answer is no. That student teacher was me. And that's back in 1991, and I know you're now doing the math. So. <laughs> In 1991, CAST was recognized as being one of the top 30 innovative education industry leaders by the New York Times. But in 1991, we didn't have a framework. We didn't have principles, guidelines, checkpoints. We didn't know we were going towards expert learners. We definitely didn't have a sense of what variable learners were. So what was I doing? I was doing what every teacher does. I was using my beliefs and I was using my knowledge to design my lessons. But I was not implementing UDL. Now why is this important to think about? It's because when we start talking about what we just did, we talk about strategies and practices. And there's a danger there. Next. And go on, uh, one and two. We have a language within our UDL echo chamber, and we say things like, that's UDL. That's not UDL. It's a little terrifying <laughs> because what that's focusing on are the strategies and the practices, right? Next. Because if we as a community focus on the strategies and practices, then we minimize the power, right? We misrepresent what it is. So within the UDL framework, we think about the guidelines often. And we've got this little crisscross thing going on. We can get to the point of designing for our expert learners, but what I like to talk about is the soil and the roots. The soil is the variability. This is the rich, loamy soil from which we draw our inspiration for the design of our lessons and our learning environments. We pull those nutrients through the roots of our UDL ecosystem, and that would be the roots of accessibility, flexibility, the goals that we're writing, the rigor that we place in there, and the choices we provide. Those flow up through the guidelines, the checkpoints, the principles. And ultimately, it's really all designed through this encapsulating thing we call our curriculum, how we're organizing all of this. 
all of it feeds on one another. And this is what I like to think about. As Luis was talking about his bicycle, I like to think about a tree and an ecosystem. So when we re reinforce and articulate that UDL is a framework, when we take in that whole big picture, we can confidently express its strengths. The third challenge, chambers within a chamber. We are at the UDL IRN. We are bringing together researchers and practitioners. Now, traditionally within this model, researchers need to come to practitioners to get their studies done. We're kind of a gateway, right? So what I know about our UDL world is that when options are provided, possibilities arise and creativity abounds. We're also a pretty flexible group. These are things that we're really, really good at. And so I think that we have the possibility of not necessarily flipping the model, but creating a different model that does not exist in the educational realm at all right now. We can do this because we understand the UDL framework. What the heck is she talking about? All right. So within learning design, there is an area where researchers are placing information about the work they are doing within the field. And I knew the researcher group was doing this, so I went to them and I knocked on their door and I said, hello, hey, so can we write up those descriptions in such a way that practitioners would be engaged in that? And they said, sure. So this is a quick, quick clip to show you where you would go within learning design. We'll see if it's going to go for us. Yes. All right. So you would go to directory. You'd hit the people directory. Up is going to pop the people directory. You do a down arrow for recognitions, and it's a UDL researcher, search. You can scroll down to whoever you want. Don Glass is who I chose. And it brings up the information about Don Glass, what his work is. He added his LinkedIn profile. You can find out about more about Don Glass. You can go to his email. You can, you can stalk him on Twitter if you want to. <laughs> but what I'm saying is we need to flip the model if we're going to advance UDL the way we want to. We need to create a more a stronger relationship between practitioners and researchers. As practitioners, we don't know what our superintendent is able to do. We don't know what our board is going to say when it comes right down to it. But for researchers to know and you to say, hey, I'm interested in that. We're doing that in our building. We've been doing that for three years. That's a gold mine. Please share and become and help erase the chamber within the chamber, chambers within the chamber, and make us understand what we're articulating, reinforcing as a larger group. All right, forward for me. And one more. All right, two last things about our great echo chamber. We are pushing the industry. Whether we're talking about fidgets or furniture, whether we are talking about lesson design or learning management system, whether we're talking about training materials or, dare I say, textbooks, right? We have the power to push the industry to be, think more flexibly and to offer us what we need. I was at a conference that had about 5,000 people there, and I walked into the, um, oh, the expo hall, and it was like, ooh, vis visual overstimulation, woo, right? And so I was thinking, oh my gosh, Marie Kondo. That was like the first thing that came into my brain. And like this Japanese art decluttering, because it was like, oh, there is a heck of a lot of clutter going on in here, right? And so I was thinking, okay, that would be the retroactive thinking. Does this bring me joy? How do I get rid of this? So what do we do? We should be putting on our UDL framework ecosystem hat, and we should be asking the question before we even purchase anything. And as we're talking to these educational designers, how would this lower the barriers in my lessons and in my learning environment? That's how we should walk into our expo halls. Now, I'm happy to say that you'll be safe here. <laughs> and finally, the safe space. Those researchers from Oxford were right. Ecosystems do, or I'm sorry, echo chambers do provide us with a nice place to have these deep conversations. And that's what the next two days are all about. But I want to add to that. So there's a group of us called the Global Partners Committee here within the UDL IRN. And the four of us, Esther Kwan from Singapore. Hello, Singapore? Hello? All right. All right. Myself, I'm here in the US. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, <laughs> Nina Thithi from Australia. Yeah, 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 okay, I know. And Pamela Janez from Chile. I know we guys, yeah, okay. All right, we got some representatives from each that are here. Uh, but the four of us have been working on our, and moving this for, vision forward. And what we came to was that people are looking for a place to connect. 
Now you're thinking, why aren't you in learning design? Well, there are some supports that right now Facebook still provides. And actually one of them is it's where people are. So we want to start with where people are. And then we're going to help bring them. But both the IRN and CAST are very supportive of this idea. So today, this is going to go live. And you will be able to go to this Facebook group called the Global Partners Network. And you can start sharing each with information with one another and talking within a safe space. Because the four of us are spread across the world, it's kind of cool because we can check it. Now, I'm going to give you a heads up. You will be asked a question about UDL because we're trying to keep out bots and nefarious people. OK. I'm. Like, it's the daylight hours now, so it would be my turn to watch the Facebook group, and I have three other sessions today. I won't be on the Facebook very much. So um, if you're trying to get in and you're like, I'm not in, Louis, it's because I just haven't done the OK yet. But you will get in. But we hope you join us, and we hope you become a part of this global connection piece. All right. So there's three things we have to watch out for. We have to watch out for that elitism, that snobbery. We have to watch out how we're talking about the framework. We're not, we don't want to minimize it. We need to think and continue to think about the whole ecosystem. And we also need to be aware of the chambers within our chamber. But I think we're fine because we have these three things. We have passion, we have influence, and we have connectedness. And that's going to help us within our echo chamber and to spread the word about UDL. Thank you very much.